the electric chair. 2D. Hey, welcome to the Electric Chair 2D. I'm Midnight Corey. Thanks for watching. This is the third episode, and I'm really excited to be here again this week. Got a lot of great stuff for you. First of all, I'm going to be talking with a great author, great actor, and that is Mr. Bradford Tatum. Of course, Bradford, among other things, has written The Monster's Muse, which is a, a book. Uh, it's a novel about the universal age of horror, which is really, really great, and uh, Bradford was a lot of fun to talk with. So, you get to do that. And I'm bringing you the first ever beer review on this video show. Um, you know, I did beer reviews all kinds of times back in the day, but uh, I've decided to bring them back. And the, the cool thing about this is I'm going to be trying them for the first time right on camera. And you'll see my reaction and what I think of it. And I'll give you my very amateurish, far from aficionado kind of review. But it's fun. So, yeah, yeah, look forward to that. Now, before we go any further in the show, uh, I just want to tell you about some other trading cards that uh, I've collected. Um, you know, I talked about the Fright Flicks trading cards a little bit earlier on uh, in episode one, but uh, I also want to talk with you about some universal horror trading cards. In 1996, Kitchen Sink Press released a series of uh, 90 cards in the base set, and they're called Universal Monsters of the Silver Screen. And uh, these kind of uh, celebrated 77 universal horror movies um, and I'm not sure if that's comprehensive if that's all of the movies that are considered universal horror I kind of think that that's that's about right but uh, these cards are in black and white printed in tritone they look beautiful they have a little red foil stamp in the corner of the series logo and uh, man it shows great great shots from all these films and there are a ton that I've never heard of but of course you got Phantom, Hunchback, Dracula, The Mummy, Frankenstein, uh, The Wolfman, all of these films, uh, just fantastic, a great celebration. You flip them over, they have explanations, you know, they go into details about the films, a little trivia thing, a little background, and it's really fun just sitting through and, uh, and reading all of these and uh, finding out more about the movies that uh, we grew up watching. And it's really spurred me to want to wanna go watch them again. But uh, I was looking, you, they got a, a checklist of all the cards, of course, and I'm going down through and, and looking, and I'm like, yeah, I've seen that, I haven't seen that, I haven't seen that. There are a ton of these that I haven't seen, and I'm sort of embarrassed, because I call myself, you know, a horror fan, I guess. Um, but, um, you know, there are a lot. So I wrote down some uh, statistics here out of the 77 movies that, I've, uh, that are, are portrayed on these cards. I've seen an abysmal 14 of them, which is 18%. Yeah. Huh. That means I haven't seen 82% of universal horror films, and uh, I love the ones that I have seen for one reason or another. Um, but uh, 64 of these movies, or 63 of these movies, I haven't seen. Again, I'm ashamed. So, I'm gonna make an effort to see these movies. I'm gonna go back and hopefully be able to talk about them on either this or the audio show, just depending on whatever is uh, more, makes more sense, I guess. But uh, yeah, so these Universal Monsters of the Silver Screen trading cards, they're really cool. Uh, like I said, 90 base cards in the set. There were 10 sticker lobby cards, which are in full color and look awesome. And apparently, out there, uh, there are some uh, biochrome cards, which are really, really rare, hard to get. I, I didn't get those in the set that I bought, but uh, those, I think, uh, profile some of the actors. And then there is one very extremely ultra-rare card out there for Bride of Frankenstein that was apparently, back in the day, redeemable for uh, a, an uncut sheet of uh, the Universal uh, card set here. And. Uh, that's what you're seeing behind me, actually. I scored one, a friend of mine uh, found this for me. I got it at a great price, and uh, it's really, really cool. So uh, um, it's a little hard to appreciate each card this way because it is double-sided, you know? You'd, you'd see all the descriptions on the back of the cards, but you know, it's a little hard to really get, uh, get down and read and study these cards in the big sheet. But this is really cool to display, and I just feel so much cooler than everybody else out there because I have this. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a very cool collectible, and uh, so I got that, and I have the actual cards in the set that are cut. So, uh, yeah, check these out. If you can find them, 
Again, uh, you can get them on eBay and you can get them on various places around the web uh, for not very much cash. And, uh, so I recommend that uh, you pick them up not only to visually enjoy these shots, but uh, to also read a lot about them and learn more about the films that we love. So there you go. Um, let's get on with the show. Let's, uh, let's talk with Bradford. Well, I welcome to the show right now an actor, an award-winning writer, and one of the most interesting people that I've ever talked to about film. And I welcome right now Mr. Bradford Tatum. Bradford, <laughs> thank you for joining me tonight. You're very welcome. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Oh, absolutely. Well, we were talking before the show here, and I said, man, I'm just going to give you more and more praise for The Monster's Muse, because that was absolutely just some great writing and a really, really fun read. Um, and uh, I think everybody should read it. So uh, how, how's the response been to that? It's good. It's good. You know, um, it's a very limited thing being one guy in a sea of published writers um but it's out on a site called goodreads mm. which is kind of like facebook for people that are reading obsessed and um it's gotten quite a few ads so i mean meaning people are adding it to their reading cues so it's been good in that respect and it's going the query route with agents and you know awesome awesome i think I was just, uh, the last time we talked, I was only a little bit of the way through it, and now uh, I finished the book, and it's uh, it's definitely a, a great read. I, it Actually, it got me interested. I'm like, I got to go back and watch some of these. You know, I, it got me real interested, especially Phantom. I went back and watched the Phantom of the Opera again, which mm. I haven't seen for years and years, and I forgot how much yeah. I loved that movie. Yeah, I, it's great. Yeah. It's great. And, you know, I'd met my wife on that soundstage yeah. when she was doing Sequest, and so I just, the whole universal thing i just have a very strong affinity for because it's basically my backyard and you know so i just I'm, started to do the research and yeah i just kind of love that era and, wow I'm, I'm so jealous of of your location and that uh you're, you're right there kind of in the middle of it all i mean is it how yeah. is it like living right in the middle of of history i mean that's the golden age right there i, I know you take a lot of advantage of that you know just by you, you visiting sets and the, the different places you've worked and things but uh, yeah how is it living there uh, hollywood kills its young it doesn't really um <laughs> it doesn't really honor that um element um most of these things were designed to only last you know the few days of shooting or a few weeks of shooting depending on what the 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 schedule was um that phantom stage is an exception for some reason that has not been torn down mm -hmm. but pretty much everything else has i mean there's little pieces of um the european village i think still at universal but uh by and large everybody goes on location now wow so, wow it, i mean you can kind of find it you know but it's tucked away or it's overgrown or you just you know it's here and but you'll get a book of old hollywood and um you'll go down hollywood boulevard or sunset boulevard and it, it, you just won't it's just completely different it's it's really 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 changed wow, wow. Yeah. that's that's amazing it it seems to me then that hollywood is so much more about the here and now and yeah. what's the biggest thing going on now which doesn't surprise i guess i'm not surprised uh, yeah, it's that way. Um, it's the same for me when I visit the Monroeville Mall uh, in Pittsburgh nowadays. You would think that there would be some sort of something there having to do with Dawn of the Dead because that's that's historic. You know, that, that's a big deal. But literally, the place has gotten a complete makeover. But, you know, nobody talks about it. It's just about, you know, sprucing up the mall and making it, you know, yeah. making it kind of what it is now and kind of forgetting yeah. the past, which is sad. Um, yeah. And uh, I wish, like, if I were to go to, to Hollywood, that's what I'd be going there to see. You know, I wouldn't want to go, you know, see, uh, you know, whatever's out now. You know, the, the big, anything about the big blockbusters coming out now. I'd want to go and see some history, you know. I'd want to, mm -hmm. man, go see, you know, the Phantom set. And I'd want to go see, man, you know, is there anything else out here that, that uh, I've been mm -hmm. watching since I was a little kid and is just going to mm -hmm. speak to me? And it's just, uh, like you said, that, that's a shame. It's not... Not really being on. No, it's it's really not preserved. There there is a mall like at Suns at Hollywood and Vine, huge huge mega mall, and they designed it so that the outside of the mall looks like the sets for uh, Intolerance, 
which is the big oh. you know, huge, huge, huge silent film. And so it's the, they're the great big Babylonian elephants and the great big That's Assyrian cool. wall. Yeah. And it's I think it's actually done to scale. It's like 40 feet high. And so, oh, wow. you know, there's that element, but it's, you know, kind of touristy and weird. And, yeah. you know, and Grauman's is there and, you know, the Roosevelt Hotel is there and, you know, but the Coconut Grove isn't there and the El Morocco is not there and Chasen's isn't there and the Brown Derby's not there and, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's a shame. So, yeah. but that's Hollywood. I mean, that's, like I said, Hollywood. I'm not surprised, but what can yeah. you do? So it's great yeah. that there are people like you out there that still really appreciate it. And, yeah. um, man, you know, just like I said, when we first talked, dude, I could have talked with you the whole night just about how much you know about film. Now, you've written, of course, The Monster's Muse, which was a great study. I mean, it really told a lot about how much you know about film, how much you appreciate film history, and uh, just how much there is to dig into there. Um, have you been uh, thinking about other writing maybe in that vein, other things having to do with uh, film history or anything like that? Because I would love, man, I would, I would totally read like a whole encyclopedia that you would write, which I'm sure you could do easily. <laughs> Just about <laughs> classic horror, just about universal horror, or kind of, kind of like that. Have you considered something like that? Um, I think about it all the time. I mean, it, yeah. it is, it is kind of a, uh, but I, I, I put so much of it into the muse. You know, so much, mm. of, so True. much of it is there. And again, I wanted to really kind of create the untold yeah. element, the whole, the whole, the whole part of the movie that that movie industry that we didn't see. Right. And then, you know, to me, the real tragedy of the book is that, you know, she, this creature just kind of outlives her usefulness in that industry because the, all that changes and she's no longer useful, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why it ends where it ends, you know, and ending with, you know, Vampyra and, and, and when your life's work becomes a joke, when it becomes a parody, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's time to kind of leave the building, you know, yeah. and that's kind of the through line. Right. You know, that's the kind of the tragedy of it. So, um, I don't know. I'll, I'll go to Monster Palooza, or my wife might do an appearance at Comic Con or something. And so I might go, and um, you'll see the odd little obsessed people that just, you know, they they did an auction a few years ago, and I have the catalog of it. Uh, Kenny Strick Fadden sold all of his old arc lights and scissor arcs wow. and all the things that he used in the original. Frankenstein. Yeah. You know, all of this crazy, crazy stuff that all had to be done practically, which you'd probably CGI today. But in those days, yeah. you really had to do it. You know, um, I, I guess it was really, it would really be someone like Gene Wilder or Mel Brooks. I mean, they have a very similar love for that era and those films. And you see it in Young Frankenstein because that's yeah. kind of an amalgam of, you know, all three Karloff versions. Mm. Mostly Son of Frankenstein. And, um, yeah. You know, I, 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 it's just it's just warm. I just love it. It's just a warm feeling when I think about that era. And yeah. you know, yeah, I know exactly. And like I said, that's that's why it was so cool. Especially reading Muse. You know, I wanted to go back and uh, I watched uh, Frankenstein again, and I can remember the scenes. The first time I saw Frankenstein when I was a little kid, and the scenes mm -hmm. that just just really got to me. You know, like the normal brain and the abnormal brain, and breaking mm -hmm. it open on the floor. Mm -hmm. And um, and then of course the you know the scene that freaks everybody out towards the end whenever he kills the girl, um, mm -hmm. I mean it, just things like that. But but going back, I think I, I've been so swept up in uh, modern horror and and a lot of uh, I don't know the the cheap I don't want to call them cheap because they're not always but more of the cheap thrill kind of thing. You know we don't get the atmosphere and the slow burn a lot that we did back then and really the charm and atmosphere. And mm -hmm. it's so worth going back and watching these movies mm -hmm. and uh, just really mm -hmm. appreciating them uh, for what they are. Even the ones that I haven't seen. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of universal horror films out there that I'm interested again in, in uh, mm -hmm. seeing now mm -hmm. that uh, have just kind of slipped through the cracks. And uh, Yeah. I mean, if, if you just spent time looking at some of the more obscure German expressionist pieces, mm. the Carl Dreyer, like Carl Dreyer's Vampire with a Y is really. Oh, yeah. Right. Up, you know, and then he went on into Joan of Arc, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. But his vampire is just beautiful. Um, Val Luton did yeah. direct. Deuced. I mean, there's a whole slew of really moody, beautiful 
things that he did. Um, body snatchers, you know, the, mm. the, I think it was kind of the follow up piece to Frankenstein Karloff did. Yeah. Based on, you know, those guys that used to dig up graves and sell them to the medical <laughs> establishment and the, Victorian age. I mean, there's just just all kinds of beautiful. Ones. Uh, a movie that I saw recently that I really enjoyed was that new Hammer Horror, Woman in Black. I don't know if you oh, saw that. Oh yes, I did. Yes, but I did. You enjoyed that. I, was, I really enjoyed it. I thought it really had the mood. I think it owed a lot to um, kind of the Japanese horror. There was a lot of those kind of quick cuts. You know what mm, I mean? Like yeah. This, but I thought they did a really really beautiful job with the with the mood of that film and all that kind of Victorian, that sense of impending dread. Um, and I hadn't seen something like that, you know, in English in a long time. So I, I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I enjoyed it as well. It was uh, everything I think I expected out of a modern hammer film. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it did a lot of things right. What's interesting. Have you ever seen uh, the 1989 uh, BBC uh, make of woman in black? No. Yeah, it's actually really great. You should uh, try and check it out. It's kind of kind of an obscure kind of thing to find. But uh, a friend of mine turned me on to that whenever uh, the the new one came out. He's like, "There's this obscure cut of it. It was a made for TV movie that the BBC did, and mm -hmm. uh, it's actually really really great. I think you'd like that too." Yeah, because it was written as a play as well. They right. did it as a play in London and the West End, and then they did it on Broadway, I think. And so it's had a few lives. Yeah, yeah. So, are there any other uh, horror out there that you've seen in the theaters, or maybe just recently that you've been impressed with? Do you watch a Do you watch a lot of new stuff? I uh, I don't. I don't. Um, I, I, again, I, I I like the the kind of the mood pieces. I like that sense of of kind of impending dread, and and it does. It's very difficult to sell that to a young producer. Yeah, you know, you know, when I go into pitch meetings or whatever, and you're making references past Gremlins, you're kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, you know? yeah. So. Well, somebody who I think is doing it right, um, making movies out there right now, and he's young, uh, very talented. I think is Ty West. Now, of course, uh, he did House of the Devil here a few years ago, and he just did The Innkeepers, oh. um, which oh. is uh, all about mood. It's all about atmosphere. And, uh, yeah, especially house of the devil. It's an homage to, to eighties horror, just how it starts out really slow. It's building character, building story, and, mm -hmm. uh, really just goes kind of crazy at the end. And, mm -hmm. uh, the innkeepers, a, a lot of the same thing. So yeah, check out some Ty West. Ty West. Great. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, I think definitely, definitely one of those ones to watch. But, uh, now we talked about Lon Chaney a little bit mm -hmm. earlier and, uh, you suggested uh, a movie to talk about tonight that I had never heard of before. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually a remake. Now, before I get into the, the specifics here, remakes are uh, really have a bad rap nowadays, to say the least. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's because there are just so many bad remakes out there right now. And so people apply those to remakes in general. And a right. lot of people, especially younger horror movie viewers, uh, see remakes as a new thing because there's so many of them out right now. But we go back to the 20s and 30s that, like we are tonight, and remakes aren't a new thing. They, they've been happening ever since <laughs> commercial film has right. begun. Um, so uh, you chose for us a Lon Chaney film, actually the final Lon Chaney film, and his first and only talkie. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, you chose, what did you choose for us tonight? And is there a specific reason that uh, you wanted to talk about this one? Uh, I chose The Unholy Three. I chose the, the 1930 talking version. Uh, not, not The original Silent 1925 was directed by Todd Browning, but this, this one was directed by Jack Conway. Um, in my mind, it's not so much a remake because it's almost the same cast. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of the talking version and since the gag in the film professor echo is a ventriloquist and it's about his voice the um the conceit of it being <laughs> being silent doing a ventriloquist act and it's silent you don't really get the skill you don't you don't really get 
<laughs> what he can do. And um, not only was Lon Chaney a fantastic physical actor, he's also an excellent vocal actor. And uh, a lot of people in Hollywood knew that, but very few of the audience knew that because they never heard him speak. And so um, it was just a real treat, I think, to see him, to hear him, you know, and, and to hear him do all the voices, the old woman and, and the parrot. And, oh, yeah. You know, I just, I just, you know, got such a kick out of it. And the fact that it's the film that was his last and, you know, he was l literally going to roll right into Dracula after this wrapped and mm. done. Yeah, yeah, that's a shame. And a lot of people out there are going to be like, we're on a horror show. Why are we talking about this kind of crime drama yeah. thriller kind of thing on a horror show? And my right. answer to that, and, and you may have more to expand on, I don't know. But my answer to that would be Lon Chaney changed horror. I mean, that's undoubtedly a fact. Um, he was the man of a thousand faces, but also the man of a thousand voices and mm -hmm. this is the only time in history that an audience gets to appreciate that, like you said. Um, and, uh, you know, just with with Phantom, like we we're talking about, Hunchback, just so many movies. He just changed horror. He changed uh, makeup and effects. And uh, really, he's a historic figure. And uh, to talk about his final film and his only uh, spoken film, his only uh, you know non-silent film, uh, I, I think is definitely worth doing on any show, especially this one, because he was horror for a long time and uh, was so uh, just uh, uh, a landmark actor and uh, so, with so much more, so much more. I mean, he, he mm -hmm. just changed the face of horror. So that's, uh, am I on target with that at all? No, I, 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 I definitely think you are, are, are on target, um, but it's how, it's how you define it. Uh, the mm -hmm. idea of supernatural horror, which is um, kind of the basic formula nowadays, there's always yeah. some supernatural element, um, was not very common in, in Cheney's day. In fact, Todd Browning hated that idea. He hated the idea of the supernatural. He always thought the real horror in the world, the real criminal, the, the real kind of scary element in the world was the criminal element, the flim-flam element, the... Mm -hmm. the you know, the shucksters, the uh, scam artists. Right. And, um, you know, his association with, with, with Cheney, it's, it's over, you know, the armless, you know, knife thrower or the clown or, you know, all, all the roles that he played, you know, the, the legless guy in the penalty, all the roles that he played, um, that supernatural element, that was considered hokey in hmm. those days. And so the idea of Dracula was a huge departure for Browning. It wasn't something, in fact, you know, in, in, in the Muse I talk about, you know, in my mind, probably Browning's original concept for it was guys pretending to be vampires, which is what London After Midnight was. Yeah. You know, you know, that's a lost film, and that's a Browning film. Um, it's a guy pretending to be a vampire. Because it would be very, very difficult to sell to a, a Depression-era audience, I guess. Mm. Uh, the idea of the supernatural it seemed like, you know, kid time stories. You know? Yeah. And, the, and, there was, and, and that element really didn't exist. So the Unholy Three, I guess, in, in its day, there wasn't really horror, but there was thriller. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, there was, you know, Frankenstein or what have you, but that, that, had, that had just come out. But the idea of the thriller, you know, the, the, the dark element, which uh, if you extend that to you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Friday the 13th or, you know, Halloween. I mean, they're basically, you know, pathologically criminal mentalities haunting mm. a film. And that's very much in keeping with something like The Unholy Three. Granted, it's a much tamer version, but these are guys that have kind of an interesting pathology that's manifested in, you know, their ability to imitate people and different types of people and you know commit crimes right right so well, that, there is there is kind of a connection there you know and it's that, interesting to see that lineage that's a great point because i think this concept again was horrific to people seeing this movie at this point in time um yeah. because uh, this amount of deception and this kind of criminal intent 
by these right. these uh, circus. They were working in a circus sideshow kind of right. uh, atmosphere. Um, and basically what happens is we got uh, three sideshow workers. Uh, Lon Chaney, of course, plays Professor Echo, who is a ventriloquist, and that's his act. And then uh, we have uh, um, Earls, Harry Earls, oh. uh, <laughs> playing the part of Tweedledee. Mm-hmm. Who is uh, he? He's a little person, very hot-headed, <laughs> very full of spite. Yeah. Um, and uh, he he plays, uh, of course, both this uh, this uh, midget kind of character in the sideshow, and then during the criminal activity, he kind of puts on the persona of a baby, which is a very a really <laughs> really convincing baby, though, right? Yeah, I mean, crazy convincing. Yeah, and then he's got that unbelievably thick German accent. So he's, it, to me, I don't know if he's a little bit deaf. He was, he's very difficult to understand. Yes. Um, and I, mean, I understood him a little bit more in Freaks because he's also yeah. placed the mid in Freaks. Right. right. Um, but in this, when he would lapse into the baby thing, especially when he would like do a line with his cigar and then he'd do the little thing where he'd be rolling <laughs> the toy. It's just, it's just, it's virtuosic. It's just such fantastic acting. <laughs> It's really worth seeing. It's really worth seeing because absolutely. Other than I, someone like Deep Roy, you know, who does, you know, works with, you know, um, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or whatever. Um, there, there's really no little person who's of that caliber of of talent. I mean, I mean, there, there are, there are, of course, of course, there yeah. are. But um, he's just so unique, and he's just so unusual, and his his <laughs> baby is so believable. It's <laughs> frighteningly believable. Um, and, and I think the idea of having this kindly old woman that's really a guy and really a criminal, you know, who steals jewelry by taking its baby into people's homes and the baby, I mean, it's just, it's just really a great, great concept. And, and it sounds really stupid, but the way it's so masterfully done, it it's is. so believably done. It you know? is. And uh, Lon Chaney, to see Lon Chaney after doing Phantom, after doing Hunchback, mm-hmm. into this little old lady role. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. It, it's so strange, but he does it perfectly in, yeah. in both films, you know. And again, I've watched both just to kind of, you know, be able to get a frame of reference and compare the two and whatever. And there, there's very little difference uh, between mm-hmm. the two other than the sound. Um, but uh, Lon Chaney can do the old woman I, just really, really well. And uh, he goes back and forth very quickly between the two in the film um, and uh, really sells it. So, again, he's just a master of of what he did. Um, And uh, so, yeah, basically what happens, we start off there in the sideshow. And, uh, of course, hot-headed Tweedledee. Man, somebody (laughs) makes a comment. And uh, I forget exactly what it is, but he ends up punching a what he, he, he like kicks a baby or something like like he does something <laughs> crazy, and so of course he gets booted out of the out, out of the circus, right. and um, the strong man, um, and I don't remember uh, what his it, it was played by two different actors in uh, both versions, um, yeah. but uh, the strong man and Professor Echo kind of follow him out uh, of the sideshow. They kind of leave right alongside of him. But of course, Echo is pulling some sort of little scam on the side with Rosie, where yeah. she's kind of the pickpocket working for mm-hmm. him. And so we get that whole element going on, which is cool. And uh, Rosie plays a big part uh, in, in this film. But it's kind of funny that Tweedledee is kind of the one that kicks this whole thing off. Yeah. And it's just because of his little outburst there and <laughs> his tendencies. Yeah, mm-hmm. that uh, he gets booted out and they decide, hey, we're going to take this on the road. We're going to pull some really big really big heist here. And of course they go after Jules, uh, uh, Lon Chaney, professor echo, uh, plays Mrs. O'Grady, the kindly mm-hmm. little old lady who, who runs <laughs> a bird shop, which is actually probably the most interesting bird shop I've ever seen in my life because mm-hmm. it has a lot of birds and, and an a gorilla. Ape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a guy in a great, in an ape suit. Yeah. It's, it's pretty out there. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, just, the, again, the differences between the two films in the original, they used a real, uh, it was a chimp, actually, mm-hmm. that they they made look big based on camera angles and the way they shot it and the way mm-hmm. they positioned actors and, and whatever. But in this film, yeah, you're right. There was, it was a guy in a chimp suit. It, mm-hmm. They did a pretty good job uh, with that for that, for, you know, 1930, you know, mm-hmm. look, look pretty good. 
Um, and so this is what we see. There's drama, of course, you know, between Rosie and Professor Echo, Rosie and Hector, who is one of the workers at the bird shop. And um, the whole thing plays out from there. We see internal turmoil going on between or among these three. Uh, and of course, how Rosie figures into that and Hector, of course. And uh, so I, I don't know that I want to spoil this and, and tell kind of what happens at the end. Although this uh, the 1930 version comes to a much more um, satisfying and I think uh, um, much more sensible ending than the 1925 version does because it, it just works out. I think better in my right. mind, yeah. but uh, a great story all around and a fun ride. Yeah. And it was hard to get for a long time. For all, I, yeah. You could get it for a long time. You'd have to catch it on Turner or whatever, but it's recently been re-released on DVD. So you can get it. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I, love, I just, I also love the dynamic of the balance of power between mm. the three, how that, that ape really has no other function other than to keep the strong man in line because he's so terrified of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, the thing with the elephant, with the baby playing with the elephant, <laughs> hiding. It's just, it's just these wonderful bits, just really, really, really great vintage, you know, wonderful, wonderful bits. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this version compared to the 25 version, I, I loved in the, in the remake, in the newer version. Um, the way they played with shadows on the wall, you know, we got a little bit of, of more expressionistic kind of filmmaking here because a lot of scenes you started off with these three shadows on the wall as they were kind of conspiring about what they were going to do next. And then the camera kind of pulled back to show the actual actors. Um, so I really, really appreciated that. Um, and you talked about the elephant scene and to be honest, I think I appreciated that elephant scene more in the silent version than I did in this one because it seemed like the silent version they had to do more visually to hold suspense and so I think they drew it out a lot longer and mm -hmm. uh, you knew what was in that elephant and they just played it and played it and played it I think they <laughs> quickened it up just a little bit for the 1930 version mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm like oh, that, I didn't get quite the suspense effect <laughs> that I did in that one but it's still a great scene you know, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but um, there wasn't much more. I mean, you, you you've obviously seen the the twenty five version. Uh -huh. um, what uh, what is your take as far as uh, you know differences or superiority? I, I definitely think I, I like the nineteen thirty version better. Um, mm -hmm. But what do you think? I, I, again, so much of of the conceit is that they do voices that, 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 that Cheney does these characters and granted he's a great, he's a great physical actor. Um, but just the treat of getting to hear him speak, mm -hmm. you know, um, that both, both versions exist and you can go back and forth or what have you. Um, but I, I think I prefer the talking version. I, I, I guess because it's the only time you get to hear him speak and, you know, you have a warm place in your heart for Lon Chaney, who's to me like one of the original method actors, yeah. you know, just way before Strasburg. I mean, he was doing just incredible, you know, real things. Um, I just, I think it's just a real gem and, and again, not very well known. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, never heard of it, which I feel ashamed because I should, cause it's kind of a, an important film uh, for Chaney and for, mm -hmm. uh, for this point in time, but I hadn't. So, yeah, thank you again for uh, for bringing this up. It was uh, absolutely, absolutely, ah, just a lot of fun. So yeah, we definitely recommend this. And um, as far as hearing Cheney speak, um, now I assume you'd seen a lot of his classic stuff before this, um, mm -hmm. and this maybe you saw a little bit later on. Um, what did you think of his voice? The tone of his voice? Were you surprised? I guess by the tone of his voice, by what he sounded like, had you imagined it some other way in your head the whole time no. along? I, I think it was one of the few times when it was exactly what I thought it should sound like. You know, I, I, I knew he was a heavy smoker, so I knew he'd have very strong resonance. Um, I, I, yeah, no, I was, I was very, I was very pleased. You know, I, I, I don't think people would be disappointed hearing him speak. In fact, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely is. So, 
Oh man, thank you again for bringing this up. Uh, this is great. You're just, uh, it seems like every time I talk to you, you just have another movie for me. That's awesome (laughs) that I've never heard of before. And that, uh, you know, it's just great. So I, I always really enjoy talking with you, man. Um, so, uh, what else you got going on? Of course, there's, uh, there's the monsters muse at, uh, I think it's what the monsters muse.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, where people can uh, find out more about you and the book. And, mm-hmm. uh, of course, it's on Kindle right now, and it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. But uh, is there anywhere else I should uh, mention where people can find out about you and what you're doing and what's going on with uh, your creative endeavors? I'm always working on something. But yeah. uh, it's, it's all in kind of the beginning stages. Um, but the book is also out on iTunes. And you can also get it on uh, Nook if people have a Nook. Cool. Um, cool. So, kind of expanded there. Awesome, awesome. Can you give me a sneak peek of anything you're working on right now? Anything, uh, anything you can give away right now, or should I just not, um, not get into that? It's set in the American West, hmm. and the lead is a female vampire, Ooh. and it has something to do with a little bit of Lincoln, a little bit of John Wilkes Booth. It's not a Blinken vampire hunter, although I have <laughs> nothing, nothing bad to say about that. God forbid. Um, but it's this is this is a female, Interesting. Uh, f- from the female perspective. So, because I've been wanting to write a western or no. something set in the American West. I love what you do. A lot of your work focuses on the female side of things, mm-hmm. on the female perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I've read, uh, uh, you know, on your website, you go into it a lot. And uh, so what is your philosophy, I guess, behind that, focusing on that? Is that something that you're consciously uh, trying to work in to your work? Or is that something that just kind of comes naturally to you? Because, of course, you know, the, the female perspective in horror um, traditionally has been uh, very absent uh, up until recently. Um, so what's your perspective on that? Uh, I guess my muses are female. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, as far as a monster's muse goes, I, I, I really needed for, for how invulnerable she is after her transformation. I needed something to balance that invulnerability with it, with an extreme vulnerability. And I thought what's more vulnerable than a 10 year old little girl. Um, and I liked the idea of being the object of someone's desire, being some possibly victimized or whatever, and, and, and her having kind of a balance in her circumstances um, um, for that. I, I guess the, the, the simple answer is it just it adds to, for me, um, again, it's something a lot of writers don't explore in that genre. And um, there's a vulnerability quotient and there's a depth depth to the female persona. And I'm just very, very inspired by it. Mm. That, um, you know, I guess it's not really conscious, to be honest with you. I just mm. kind of gravitate toward that. I just kind of gravitate, you know, I have a daughter and a wife and I'm, I'm constantly uh, just inspired by them and i guess that that kind of feeds into it a lot yeah yeah you know yeah i really appreciate that and i uh just cheers to you for for doing that and and i uh, like women i mean i love women so hey <laughs> write about them and see them yeah. and look them. you know yeah. the more women you can you can yeah. write about and, and everything the better you know in my mind so that that's great so well, thank you, Bradford. It's been great talking with you tonight. And uh, again, it's just been uh, fantastic talking with you about these films. I mean, uh, I hope we can do this again. And uh, yeah. well, thanks again, man. And You're uh, welcome. let's do this again soon. OK, thank you, Corey. Well, if you've been listening to my podcast for any amount of time, you'll know that uh, back in the day on the Midnight Podcast and even on my Midnight Corey podcast, there for a while i would do beer reviews or i would at least invite beer reviews i did some of my own but of course the most uh infamous notorious beer reviewer on my show is brian from colorado and i certainly appreciated all of that and uh, brian's become a good friend but um brian brian isn't going to appear on this episode so i don't know why i brought him up except that he did great beer reviews and i'm going to attempt 
to review some beers now on this show, because why not? I like to try out lots of different kinds of beers. I'm, I'm a big fan, although I am far from an aficionado. Um, I don't hold the, you know, kind of talent or uh, knowledge that Brian does. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to do what I do and uh, let you know if I think this is a beer you should try. Um, so I'm going to try out beers right on camera, and I'll let you know firsthand my first impression of the beer and whether I think it's worth it. Now, this one, a uh, little backstory to this. It caught my eye on the shelf because back in the 90s especially, I was a big fan of a record label called Sub Pop. I was a Seattle label because I was a huge Nirvana fan, and Nirvana got their first kind of record label thing on Sub Pop Records, and actually Sub Pop had a lot of excellent artists come through there, man, like uh, Mud Honey and uh, Soundguard, you know, great, great artists, and that's, again, where Nirvana got their start, and I was such a huge Nirvana fan. So, I'm uh, going up and down the aisle in the beer store, and this beer caught my eye. This is Loser Pale Ale by Sub Pop, also, uh, you know, by uh, Elysian Brewing, Elysian Brewing, I don't know how to pronounce it, but who cares? Sub Pop. <laughs> Um, so immediately, I'm like, this is a beer I got to try out. Uh, you know, you can't go wrong. Plain white label, black lettering, um, the, the uh, corporate beer still sucks kind of uh, tagline on it. Of course, they're playing off of, you know, Kurt wore that uh, corporate music sucks t shirt on uh, the cover of Rolling Stone years and years ago. So, um, you know, they're playing off that, so of course, you know, and that's Sub Pop's claim to fame, of course, is Nirvana. Um, so, yeah, but uh, really cool. So I'm like, I have to try it. I'm not necessarily a Pale Ale fan. I like Pale Ale, but actually IPAs, India Pale Ales are what I really like. But uh, I'm gonna, I got a glass here. I'm gonna crack this open and uh, let you know what I think. So let's, uh, let's open this bad boy here. And uh, cracking this open just for you. So I hope you appreciate this. But uh, we're gonna give it a little try here. We're gonna pour her in there and we'll be able to get the whole thing in the glass there, but uh, let me show you how she pours. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. A yeah, little, little head on it. You know, nothing too crazy, but uh, a nice, nice hazy amber color. I have to say, I, I, I like the looks of that. So, here it is. Here's the first taste of Loser Pale Ale uh, by uh, Sub Pop and Elijah Brewing. Hmm. Definitely, um, definitely a pale ale. A um, little, uh, little bitter, a little hoppy. Actually, a little bit hoppier than I expected, so that's kind of nice. Uh, I like my hops, that's for sure. Um, you can see not much lacing around the top. But, uh, wow, this is actually really good. It reminds me sort of of uh, an IPA. Um, have a little sweetness in there. Have a little um, kind of... Uh, I don't know if you want to call it like a, a, a graham cracker kind of kind of taste to it. I don't know. I don't know. Kind of weird. You know, there's a lot of diverse flavors that beer reviewers use where they uh, review beer. And uh, there's all kinds of things. So this is a... Uh... Wow. This is a great beer. Um, I'm impressed, actually. I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, but uh, this is definitely a beer you should check out if you're a fan of pale ales, India pale ales. Definitely the hops are coming through. Uh, which is a good thing, but uh, there's some sweetness there. It's not as uh, kind of punch you in the face as a lot of IPAs are, um, but uh, it's definitely definitely a good beer. A lot of flavor, very full, and uh, very satisfying. I should have bought a couple of these, but I didn't. I just have this one, but I'll go back for more for sure. So, again, this is a Loser Pale Ale, um, Elijah Brewing. Now, here's what's weird. Here's what's weird. Uh, my friend Mike from Evil Episodes. Um, he's interested in doing some beer reviews with me, and I really hope we do. I'd love to Skype with him, and we both taste a beer at the same time. And everything. I'm in Pennsylvania. Mike is in California. Okay. Now, this is out of Seattle. Now, you would think that him being West Coast and everything, Seattle is like, you know, right up there uh, from California. Nowhere near as far as Pennsylvania is from Seattle. So I get a hold of Mike, and I'm like, dude, you have this beer because if so, I'd love to review it with you on the on the show. He looks it up. They don't they don't ship this to California. <laughs> What's up with that? So 
if by some freak chance uh, representatives from Elijah Brewing are, are watching this or are, you know, hear about this, start shipping some beer to California because my friend Mike needs to enjoy this beer. So there we go. That's some uh, sub pop beer for you. I hope you enjoyed the review. There'll be more to come, but uh, cheers. Cheers.